All right, time to start talking about Westworld. Westworld. It's the best world from what I hear. Maybe Westworld. not actually to live in, but it's a great one to watch. Definitely. That is for sure. Well, so this is a uh, second opinion that you're listening to. Uh, so we'll do uh, kind of follow the same form that some of our other uh, review shows about uh, television and other sorts of media have followed, starting with a spoiler-free section, and then uh, we'll make it pretty darn clear when we're about to move into stuff that might spoil things for you. Uh, so uh, if, if, if you haven't seen the show yet, and I think uh, pretty much anyone who's ever seen it will tell you that this is a show worth watching through, um, you might want to stop when we say that we're going to move into the spoilers portion and maybe uh, pick things back up once you've uh, given the show a, a, a full watching. Uh, this is, I think, one of our favorite shows, the two of us for sure on this. Um, so it's not something that you really want to miss if you've got it available. Um, but, you know, if you don't mind and just want to listen to the spoilers, hey, I do that sometimes. Uh, feel free to do that too. So I guess, you never know. Maybe if you uh-huh. are debating whether or not to watch the show and you hear the spoilers, that might make you want to watch the show. That's I wouldn't necessarily recommend doing it in that order, but it's always an option. You know, that is often how I do it. I'll listen to a podcast about something and decide I want to watch it after I've heard all the twists and turns, um, which is admittedly not not always the best thing to do. But if it's something that's like I'm not, I'm kind of on the fence about, I feel like that's a reasonable way to do it. But this is like another in the series of awesome things that uh, have kind of come out from like really suspenseful things that have come out from HBO, other things being like Game of Thrones and The Wire um, and, you know, some really good stuff by Christopher and Jonathan Nolan. Uh, and, you know, the, the creators behind this have, have really done some great stuff. So if you've liked any of the Nolan brothers things, like uh, um, I think, uh, I think even like Lost, what the Nolans were involved in that somehow, but like JJ uh, well, Abrams Vinci. was involved with that. I think he oh, was in some way right. with Westworld too, wasn't he? That's right. That's right. I forgot about it. His Bad Robot was like one of the production companies um, on Westworld. Is that JJ Abrams' company? I think it is. Bad Robot. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, because yep. that was definitely in the end. I'm like, that's usually like movie movie studios and things. Yep. A- Alias, Lost Fringe, Person of Interest, Revolution, and Westworld alongside feature length films, Cloverfield, Star Trek, Super Eats, Super Eight. Star Trek Into Darkness, Mission Impossible Ghost Protocol, Mission Impossible Rogue Nation, Star Wars The Force Awakens, 10 Cloverfield Lane, and Star Trek Beyond. Wow, what a... What a, what a roster, right? Resume there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, something else. Um, well, but like a lot of those other properties, uh, it's this isn't the first in uh, the, the kind of Westworld franchise. There's a movie uh, that this TV show is based loosely on, uh, from 1973, it sounds like. Uh, my, my dad, my father actually went to see it. Um, not necessarily in theaters, I don't think, because he would have been like not very old then. But um, uh, after after it came out, he watched it uh, on, I don't know, Laserdisc. How did people watch movies back then? I don't know. Um, only Laserdisc. Only else. Laserdisc, pretty much. There was no such thing as VHSs. Betamax, perhaps. Um, <laughs> wow. Wow. All that's to say, it's kind of interesting because he was able to spoil a couple things for me there. I won't discuss what those are. Maybe we'll discuss it in the spoiler section. Who knows? But it's, it's interesting because if you have seen that movie, there's some things that it definitely inherits from and others perhaps less so. Uh, but as you mentioned, like the pedigree of the folks who made this thing is, is pretty, uh, or their, their previous work is pretty, pretty amazing. Uh, husband and wife, Jonathan Nolan and Lisa Joy uh, are kind of the co-creators uh, of the series. And I, I believe Christopher Nolan has some involvement in it. Probably, like, if nothing else, like, they talked about it at dinner sometimes. I don't know. Um, yeah, there are, Jonathan <laughs> Nolan and Christopher Nolan are brothers, so I think yeah. they both kind of fed off each other, I would assume. I know Jonathan is a little younger, so That's maybe true. a little more One Direction, but uh, That's true. one-sided. That is true. But they're, you know, really cool folks, and they've all done some uh, some really interesting work in this sort of spec fic, sci-fi fic, uh, kind of space. Lisa Joy was a writer, for example, of Pushing Daisies and Burn Notice, and I believe Battlestar Galactica as well. And as we mentioned, Jonathan Nolan also did Person of Interest and some other related things. Consulting Interstellar. On Interstellar, for example, which is another really great... That's like my favorite movie. I guess I realized as we were writing these notes that I think you know Jonathan Nolan's probably my favorite, I guess, showrunner, writer, mm-hmm. 
story creator person for for a film or tv based medium yep i'm with i'm very much with you there um he's pretty good and also uh the guy who did luther whose name i always forget uh mule cross uh both both are really great folks so uh, but then the story editor is also an individual who has a really interesting kind of uh, body of work that precedes him. Charles Yu, uh, he actually has uh, is more like prolific right now as a uh, writer. So he has two books out, one that's a collection of short stories called Sorry, Please, Thank You, uh, and another that is uh, kind of a standalone novel, How to Live Safely in a Science Fictional Universe. Both are positively, absolutely brilliant. Uh, and if you read those, you'll see some kind of parallels between some aspects of like the absurdism and, uh, of, of Westworld in some ways and the absurdism in those two novels, though, though admittedly those books take it a little bit, uh, a little bit further. Uh, but simultaneously too, they both deal with this like nonlinear sort of sort of timeline that the Nolans of course are so uh, famous for working with uh, and uh, other, other aspects too, like, um, like AI and how how a mixed world where where folks uh, where humans and AIs might coexist, what that what that might look like. So definitely, if you liked Westworld, uh, his books are something that you're absolutely going to want to check out. Um, how to Live Safely in a Science Fictional Universe is probably one of my favorite novels ever. It's not for everybody, admittedly, but if you like, um, if if you've read and enjoyed Vonnegut. Um, if you've read and enjoyed any any like postmodern stuff like David Foster Wallace, How to Live Safely in a Science Fictional Universe will almost certainly be something you'll enjoy. Yeah, totally. Now, I think um, I guess for the our last bit of spoiler-free section here, I just want to give a very brief overview of what the show is about. So it's a Absolutely. blend of science fiction and western. So the the whole universe exists. Mm-hmm. There's um, it's in the future sometime, and there's this kind of adventure theme park um called Westworld and there are hosts which are kind of androids that are um programmed and then there are hosts sorry they are the hosts and then your guests are humans who pay a lot of money i saw somewhere maybe $40,000 per day to come there and um they can just choose different stories that they they do in this park it's kind of a free for all yes indeed yes indeed so a couple aspects of this that are that are kind of uh interesting right is like the cost right that's that's something that wasn't immediately apparent to me when i uh when i first started watching but that's absolutely something that um kind of proves kind of proves key and also this like juxtaposition of like ai that's that's creating like this this like false emulated western environment which is like um super bonkers because like for it, one would think, right? Like when you think about a show about AI, you don't really have that mixed with like a, a um, you know, kind oh, of like AI, a, Western, a West Western environment. They, click. they are the same thing. <laughs> right, right. It's like, you know, usually when you think of that, like I would think of like, um, like if you've ever seen those like old like reenactments, right? Of like, you know, folks mining in California or something like that, like mining yeah. for gold in California and stuff. Like um, what, what are they called? Oh, the Gold Rush. That's what it's called. The, yeah, yeah. Uh, Hi, Brandon. I exist. Um, or do I? Um, but the, the um, like those, those genres are really interesting because like when, when somebody described it to me as a space Western, I was like, oh man, I'm not really here for that Western sort of thing. But you know. It's, it's not Firefly. I'll tell you that. It's not Firefly. Exactly. Um, I actually really didn't like Firefly, unpopular opinion. But um, I, I hope, I hope. I can still be friends with all of you out there listening. So to this. I watched Firefly this summer for the first time, and I oh, liked yeah? it. But I I think Westworld is a whole new level. Um, Absolutely, having having a show about kind of a spaceship going around. It's kind of Firefly and Dark Matter are kind of similar in many ways because uh-huh. they're both kind of this crew on a ship and they go around and do things, and you kind of discover the world they're in. Yeah, Westworld is is a bit larger than that. Um, it focuses on a few characters and things, of course, but it's also dealing with some more, I guess, fundamental questions about um, what might be right or, you know, I, I can't spoil anything here. The yeah. larger, larger things come up than come up in something like Firefly or Dark Matter. 
Absolutely, absolutely. And I think we'll talk about this a little bit more when we get into the spoilery section. But um, at this point, I guess one thing I'll say is that the Nolans are, that's one of the things I find really compelling about the, the work of Christopher and Jonathan Nolan um, and and uh, their co-creators in this particular show, but also in everything else that they've done, is that like Interstellar has the same sort of thing. Like, like what? how, how do we come to terms with the fact that we're, that we might not be able to continue to live on earth right like earth might not be able to support us and interstellar like like what what does it feel like to have um you know somebody able to like invade your thoughts and um and alter alter your cognition basically right which i know like for for a lot of folks uh for me particularly that's a really like compelling thing to um to like try to understand right and it's certainly compelling yeah. from a perspective of like um the like allegorical like parallels to um like like um like in, in inception like emotional abuse right stuff stuff like that that's like you know really and, and the westworld does a similar sort of thing i think with with this idea of like um like when when does when, when might AI become conscious and what implications might that have among other things? Where, where is the barrier between artificial intelligence and something independent and free thinking? Exactly. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. So like this, this is very much in line with that. I guess we're probably at the limit of where we can talk about the show without uh, giving too much away. Yes. So this is your final warning. Spoilers ahead. Uh, cue some big alarm sound or something, right? So I guess now we're officially in spoiler mode. There's no turning back. No turning back indeed. Unless you rewind. But True, yes. can't do that. <laughs> so All right. I don't know how we should best group this. We kind of have some scattered thoughts here in our show notes. Um, I think, I think yeah, start with the, the first f- impression after we watched it, what we were kind yeah. of thinking about. That yeah. would be a good place to start. Absolutely. So for me, I actually ended up watching just the first episode um, on like a, when, when HBO made it free online for anyone to view and the connection was so ridiculously bad. Um, now my, my internet's pretty high quality here, so I wasn't quite sure what was going on, but the, I, like the app just kept freaking out. Uh, I was streaming it to a Chromecast. The app just kept freaking out and I was not, not having it. So I, I actually lost it for like a couple weeks, um, which is super upsetting because the first episode is really good. Um, but then I think they spent I spent million dollars on that pilot. No, I'm sure. I'm sure they they blew through every penny of that and more. Like that's bonkers. Um, but it's a really beautiful, beautiful show. Like the art direction, as with many of the things that came before it, is like spot on. Um, they've got a great uh, crew of actors. Um, the story is certainly really well thought out in a way that kind of progressively reveals things to you in a way that doesn't make you feel like, um, like lost kind of did almost like with, with the weird kind of um, Deus Ex Machina sort of like jumps between things. It's really well thought out to progressively reveal things. Um, Yeah. I thought that was a very good review. reveal, And um, I think one of the big kind of looking, looking back at the season, one of the big, things this does right is the non-linear storyline storyline and absolutely at first i i was watching it i remember thinking like okay this is a memory this is current day but there's that third uh-huh. time as well and that's what i i really didn't see that till kind of the the end when it was revealed that um um william is the man in black yep and and then i was like oh, oh it makes so much sense and i just wanted to from that point i wanted to watch the whole entire show again yeah, I will at some point, but I haven't yet. Yep, absolutely. I'd agree completely. Now, for, now for me, like admittedly, um, one of the things that, um, like, one of the first things that kind of triggered for me is there's, there's this moment where uh, Anthony Hopkins, who plays uh, Dr. Robert Ford, the park director of Westworld, I sometimes forget these folks' names and I'll refer to them by their names and other things, uh, <laughs> it, which which is not great, or their names as actors. Uh, so I, you might hear me refer to Anthony Hopkins or my pet name for him, Tony Hops, um, throughout throughout this. Uh, those are all the same person, Dr. Robert Ford, Anthony Hopkins, Tony Hops. They're all the one. Uh, if you hear me refer to, to him as Hannibal Lecter, now you know I really messed something up. Uh, that's his character. 
in the 90s era movie Silence of the Lambs, which is really good. And you should see it too. Um, but that has almost 0% bearing on this conversation. Um, but the point where he discusses this idea of the reverie, right, which is this update to the hosts that allows them to kind of draw on fragments of their past lives um, to like, to create these like little gestures and little like uh, reminders of things that have already happened. And like, I think this is, um, if I recall correctly, this is exposed in the first episode, possibly the first or second episode. First um, episode, I think it's the very now, first episode. I just have to ask, was this, was this actually an update that went out or was this just the, the old Arnold code still taking, just still coming up because it seemed like that these, the hosts always had, you know, they were always remembering things and coming back to, I mean, the, in the final episode or two, Dolores was on her big self-discovery trip with Will. Uh-huh. I mean, she didn't quite make it to the end, but she nearly got there. And that was just a, like two years into the park. Mm-hmm. And then we cut to 34 years later and, or 30 years later, and she's still doing that. Right. So my, my understanding is that Dolores is the only host that's still running Arnold's patched, like, reveries right um okay. all the other a, a bunch of the other hosts uh receive the update right so the the first few episodes talk about this update that bernard and his behavior team pushed out um that that enabled these reveries right um i don't know i don't know what timeline this this particularly takes place in i think you probably have a better idea of that than i do um but that would be the more present day around 2054 i believe that would be my guess as well um, or and, 52, sorry, 2052. Yeah. So when, when that happens, my understanding is that that's when a lot of these weird, like aberrant behaviors happen with the woodcutter and um, uh, Maeve, right? So I, I feel like, for example, Maeve doesn't, um, Maeve's timeline, when that comes out, um, that that is closer to the 2052, 2054 kind of, kind of era after Bernard... Uh, kind of releases that update and kind of quizzically is like, huh, I wonder what this thing will do. Well, that's, you know, that's never a problem. It's never a problem to have these hosts that are so frequently mistreated by, by, by the guests, right? Remember things from before that will, that will never have any consequences. No, of there's no problem there. What's the other? <laughs> right. Like that's, that's never the, the thing that uh, signals the end of humanity when we allow. <laughs> yeah. Like, like I just see, I, the, the thing that I kept thinking of when I heard that was um, the old, the well, relatively recent Boston Dynamics dog robot video. Have you you've seen that one, right? Uh, where yeah, the yeah. man kicks over the Boston Dynamics robot that's kind of like named Spot or something. Uh, and it's yeah. like, oh no, this is how we're all going to die because eventually those robots are going to be outfitted with bombs. And then that's that's the end of the well, they're gonna They're going to remember everyone who kicked them. And they're going to keep that. Uh, let's see. I want to see if I can find this because it is super frightening. Here we go. That is going in the show notes because that is that, like that that's absolutely what's going to happen. Like they're going to they're going to seek vengeance sometime if we if we let them remember like that. Um so I guess all, all that's to say that like that that's really one of those moments that like the reveal um of uh of Ed Harris um uh, so Ed Harris is, uh, is the actor's name, but the character is kind of referred to as the man in the black hat who we later find out is the same as um, McPoyle, otherwise known as Jimmy Simpson. Uh, McPoyle from Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Wow, this like actor. His name is, is his name is Will or William? William, yeah, that's right. There we go. <laughs> it's going to cause problems with me because I know all these actors from other things and that's their main character to me. But yes, William, uh, William's link to Ed Harris is another one of those that helped kind of create that sense of, of multiple timelines, I guess, and, and linked that like nonlinearness, I feel. Yeah. I was watching um, clips of episode two just the other day. And yeah. there was a time when Dolores was going up to her father's house and the, the bandits were there shooting people and it, her mother was just shot. And there's a guy on the porch who sees Dolores and she's running up to him. And uh-huh. then she pauses a bit. She gets shot and then she feels her stomach and it's of course bloody and everything. And then it cuts to a new shot and then she's standing there and she looks down, she's not shot. And then she just runs away. And that's totally just her remembering in the past and being yeah. able to, to do things like, Oh, I should run away because I'll probably get shot. Cause I, so wow. How do I remember being shot? This is bizarre. And then she yeah. runs away. And I just have to think 
that must be the worst thing to remember all of these past things that you don't remember just yeah. in f- flashbacks but because they're they're ai and androids it is that's that is their reality while they're thinking of it right and so it's right. this super confusing thing and being able to understand that that was a previous life and you are you are on a loop and you always will come back that kind of is what pushes them to be self-aware Absolutely, absolutely, and like th- that. Another component of this too, similar to Inception, is like how there's almost like this, this like, um, this uh, like link towards um, like physical and emotional abuse and re- and reactions to that. And there's this really telling moment I think where uh, Anthony Hopkins' character Robert Ford is like basically says basically describes what happens to hosts who remember the things that happen to them is that they he he did, actually describes it as going insane, which is like so. I think a, a toxic way to think about it. Um, and I think that's something that we see as the, as, as the show progresses, the show very much doesn't, uh, the showrunners very much don't agree with that interpretation. Um, but that's also something that's, I think very, very frequently under, like um, understood about these things where people react to certain situations and that's like, no, there's like actual pain there. Right. Um, I think that's something. Yeah. That's the, I think really, the feelings really they all felt. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the feelings they all felt were were real to them, and so we think about it in that way that they keep they keep getting hurt and suffering, and it's it's endless that like ethical things start to come up, mm-hmm. and that was something um, in one of their flashbacks of Arnold talking with Dolores, bringing up that um, she can't live in a world like this, that all the original uh-huh. hosts can't. So I think that's why he had Dolores kill them all. But I have to wonder then why didn't he have Dolores? kill herself as well if he was trying to stop the park from being opened or was it she had progressed the furthest so she, he wanted to give her a chance how did I, you interpret that's that was my understanding as well that was my interpretation as well um that's absolutely yeah absolutely the situation and like one aside to you did you catch like uh dolores like um the a, a word of that same spelling in spanish it like means means pain dolor- dolores like like pains pain okay uh which is like omg omg oh, that's, that's so, so good like, right like um and of course it's also just a common name in the american south as well but like <laughs> yeah. yeah i don't know but like whether there was meaning behind that or not i can't describe but it's just like one of those little things that is like uh the the touch of a really well edited story i feel um also like dolores as a character is just super great um and like uh the there are all these situations where where you hear um where you just get to see how her character is like so so completely developed how how she's kind of the almost the center of the park as a result of that um because she's like one of the one of the oldest hosts uh who's been around essentially since the beginning as we as we find out later on um yeah she's still a a metal and you know physical thing inside rather than artificial uh organs and everything yeah yeah exactly <coughs> exactly <laughs> I, I yeah i just love how we write in here is dolores a super intelligent death ai now and all i can think so of when i read that is same <laughs> that's something i was thinking of yeah going through um uh, the whole season i just feel bad for dolores because she's she's there's so many shots of her just crying like just her suffering and and yeah. not understanding things and just seeing pain and things and remembering back to to memories that she doesn't understand. Mm-hmm. At the end, I feel so happy for her that she she figures it out. And when she heard, when she realizes that the voice she's been hearing has been herself, I was so happy. Uh-huh. But then I realized in the last scene when she goes and kills everyone, that was her own her her, her own free will, and it was kind of yep. pushed to her from Ford. But yeah. I have to wonder what drove her to do that. Does she? Because towards the end, especially, they were hinting at that the hosts are superior to humans, and mm-hmm. I have to think. Uh, is this show going to turn towards? I, I I don't want it to become humans versus the hosts because that right. that just the story's been told so many times, and I really hope there's something more and there's uh, a misunderstanding happening that they can work through. Right, right, absolutely. I think you're I think you're onto something there, and I hope um, if you get a chance to read, sorry, please, thank you. That collection of short stories, I think you'll see. I, I have an idea based on based on that book where where this might be going potentially. I'm not, of course, I'm not hundred percent sure because like the people can do things different than what they already already written. But based on like, I, I think that there are some things that we can see from the other works of the folks who are, who are kind of controlling the story here, but there's some hint on that. And I think there is uh, kind of a, 
um, so, something more complex than just that. Because I think you're right. The other kind of example for this is uh, Ex Machina, the the movie that came out a year or two ago, uh, also about AI. Um, did you very ever good. see that one, Brian? Holy, yeah, it's yeah, a very, it's yeah. a very very good one. Um, and that's in the end of that movie. Uh, spoiler alert: If you haven't seen Ex Machina, you should probably stop listening now. But essentially, what happens at the end is um, the AIs um, end up like going on a killing spree of the folks who created them, which TBH is kind of deserved because they're all jerks. Um, yeah. But uh, <laughs> but they they kill all the AIs and then, or they kill all the humans and then um, they they repair themselves and then walk on out um, and and join join the world of the living and that's kind of the end of it. I, th- I feel like on one hand, Westworld would be just as compelling if it ended here, but I think that in order for them to have a second season and a third season. It's going. It's only going to get potentially like better. Like they they have other other things in store, uh, that other than just like Dolores coming out and being like, man, humans suck. Uh, even though of course they do, um, but I, I I have higher hopes. That's for sure. And I I think you know it was teased at the end of episode ten, of mm-hmm. they went to the next building and instead of WW for Westworld it was SW and there are a bunch of samurai inside. Samurai so world, I think, yeah. I think we're gonna see. A different park in part next season um oh you're so the, right the, see the scale of this park and i'm you know because the note that felix gave to mave about uh-huh. where to find her daughter said park one area whatever sector whatever and so how many parks are there what are the struggles robert ford was of course in charge of westworld at the beginning of this park but does is he also involved with other parks how how does this affect each other? Right. When they refer to the park, are they referring to just Westworld or are they referring to all of like like um all of the worlds, whatever these worlds might be? But it you know, when I saw that at first I was like, Ugh, there's this um like like um like have you have you seen Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? That's another story it's that's been kind a long of has, time, but yeah. So there's there's the um there's the character who um, runs this like like world factory, right? Where they just build a bunch of different planets and ship them out and call it good. Um, yeah. Like that that was very much the same sort of thing I saw here. It's like um, I, I feel like the the way that it's organized, like Ford runs all of the parks, but I could be I could be very very wrong about that. Um, may, well, you know, he he runs all the parks until he doesn't run any of the parks. Womp, 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 womp. I almost could see it as. Arnold and Ford started started with Westworld. That was the first one. Yeah, and you know after the success, that's probably what they're focused the most on because it's the oldest. Yeah. But of course, they're the same creations and same format is is taken to other worlds or other parks as well. Yep. Then it's just instanti- instantiation thereafter, just churning out hosts, churning out narratives. Also, the the um ah, I forgot the name of the guy who's like head of story. Also, I think another thing that's kind of interesting that we haven't talked about yet is like this idea of the departments. There's there's narrative, there's QA, which I love, uh, and then there's uh, there's behavior. QA is really funny because they're like military, right? So they've all got tasers and stuff, and and like riot gear to go in and take care of the hosts and 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 bring them back, right? You know, neutralize yeah. them and bring them back, which is just like hilarious because like I like there's a a couple of my friends are in QA at work and they're like they would not do that. But like the idea that that's what quality assurance is, right. It's like, ah, you know, that is what quality assurance is applied to this. Um, and like, um, that context is pretty awesome. And like, that, that's a, that's a touch that I think can definitely be attributed to Charles. Yu. if you've read any of his stuff, he does other kind of weird things like that, where you take kind of commonplace names for things and ascribe it really like absurd characteristics that also kind of makes sense for the situation they're in. Behavior is really interesting too, because that's the one that, um, Bernard, uh, Bernard's character um, leads, right? So um, they help to kind of debug and um, create new different ways for the host to be more lifelike. And then the tensions between that and narrative, which kind of would prefer the host be not as lifelike, but um, create these different experiences. So they, for... they, they talk about simple and they right. almost, someone almost even said, even a little me- uh, mechanized is preferable because mm-hmm. it's, I, well, I don't know. Yeah, there's the push of just having it work be the same and being completely independent and autonomous and mm-hmm. self-thinking and imp- improvising. Yep. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. I guess another sort of, uh, well, one tangent on this front is um, we, we have this idea of the character Arnold, who is, who is revealed to us early on because some, sometimes they'll reference Arnold as like uh, the hosts will be talking to Arnold. Right. And, um, but they're really just um, talking to themselves, but they're just talking to themselves. Right. Which is the, which is the, um, they're listening to their own thoughts and yeah. 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 I think that's a really interesting way of, of putting in independent thought. Oh, it's someone else, you know, Mm -hmm. as, as an AI who, who is discovering that they can think, not, not understanding it and thinking it's something else, telling them what to do, Mm -hmm. saying, or imagining that it's someone else. And the, the voice that Dolores hears in her head is a mix between um, F- Arnold Ford or Bernard, because we didn't know it was Arnold at the time, Yeah, Ford and herself. And the final review, the reveal that she was mm-hmm. hearing herself, I thought was fantastically executed because she's sitting down looking at, it was either Arnold or, or Ford. And yeah, the chair, the chair. Um, yeah. And the different room people was, occupying the chair, yeah. And then she hears when she's, it's the cameras on her and it, it goes from um, Arnold's voice, Ford's voice, and then her voice. And then the camera mm-hmm. moves and she's looking at herself. I thought that was yep. fantastic. And I was, oh, that that was such a good scene. Like Evan Rachel Wood, the actress who plays, um, who plays Dolores is like certainly the best host. Um, like the be- the best actress that could have ever possibly played that character. Like that is yeah, absolutely. She does such a good job. Like at, at the beginning, you see the transition between like being in character and then like frozen, right? In analysis mode, right? Um, and yeah. there's so many other situations just like that. Yeah. I think there's oh one gosh. time where she has to be expressionless, you know, no emotion or no response, but she's still crying. And that's just ridiculous. Oh, that was crazy. Yeah. Absolutely. So Absolutely. Um, Maeve also was really good at that. Teddy was a little bit, I mean, I don't know, maybe just because I know James Marsden from like 30 Rock and Hairspray, but like Teddy was not, he was, he was a good, he's a good actor, but he's not as good at playing a host. He's just always James Marsden. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I wasn't, I'm not a huge fan of him as Cyclops in the X-Men yeah. original trilogy, but I thought he did a much better job as Teddy here. I liked that, but he always felt like, even though he was having some memories later on, he always mm-hmm. felt at a much lesser level than Dolores or or Maeve. And I think that's by design because he's he's really just kind of like a dopey, dopey little guy. <laughs> but I <laughs> but, did feel bad for him too because he's he's I think he's one the ho- one of the hosts that's been killed the most number of times. I think oh, over totally. a thousand times. <laughs> yeah, because he he's always going with his default loop is going to Dolores's father and then mm-hmm. shooting and then getting killed. Yeah, yeah. I will also yeah. say I really like that uh, Stephen Ogg, who who played Trevor in Grand Theft Auto Five, was mm-hmm. the the madman and the was he the milkman? Mm-hmm. Yes, the, indeed he was. Oh, he he's such a good actor. I really like him. Oh, uh, that part was I'm so, so happy he was great. In the show. That was so great. The 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 in the first couple episodes, there's that there's that whole bit with the hosts that are breaking the loop. Those were the other ones that were upgraded to have their reveries, right? Yeah. And would keep turning on on the host that killed them in previous narratives, and, and the way they were just like, um, you know, nonchalantly pour milk on the people they killed was just like, oh my god, this is so like. This and is- he had like a hole in his stomach, so he was drinking and it was just <laughs> squirting out of his stomach. <laughs> that was that was so great because that's like an absolutely plausible way for an AI to fail, right? Like, yeah, that is exactly what would what what I feel like would happen if I wrote a bug into into some code that was running on uh, like a character or a consciousness, right? Of course, like the work that we do is probably not, ne- not like parallel in that way, but it's like it, the absolute manifestation of like a bug in con- consciousness almost. That's like fascinating yeah. to me or a, a bug in false consciousness, I should say, because there are other things that are probably more clearly att- attributable to that. Um, but one question I have about Arnold and Arnold's character um, is did you ever think that we had already seen Arnold before when they used the name? I thought maybe I thought there was going to be a reveal of what happened to Arnold. Mm-hmm. Um, at first, I didn't really want to believe that it was Dolores who killed him. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh my gosh, what happened? And um, I can't say, yeah, I was I was still surprised when it was revealed that Bernard was, was Arnold, mm-hmm. or at least based on Arnold. Yeah. But... 
um i was i was watching the show with my parents and i caught that he was a host mm-hmm. like two minutes before my parents mm-hmm. and i was like oh it makes so much sense and they didn't mm-hmm. say anything and then then they then like two minutes later when it was very explicitly said they got it too but i don't i think that was a, a very good twist and um i think bernard was really the only kind of character who could have been arnold mm-hmm. um being um i think i did kind of think it might have been robert ford was arnold mm-hmm. at some point i think maybe i thought that but i didn't ultimately and Ed Harris's or the man in black being Arnold didn't make sense to me because he kept looking for the maze. And as the season went on, that was more and more clearly tied to Arnold. Mm -hmm. So I didn't think it was him either. Absolutely. Those, those are, those are absolutely. Yeah. Valid approaches. Admittedly, I held on to Ed Harris or the man in black being Arnold for a little bit longer than probably I ought to have just because like um, it, it kind of made some degree of sense based on i i the, there was one way that um that dr ford referred to um referred to the character as being like lost in the park and i'm like oh well you know the person who we met who's been lost in the park you know the human who's lost in the park that's ed harris so it's got to be ed yeah harris. that was probably a line to try to confuse people i would bet and yeah. i fell down that rabbit hole like it was made for me um but then, yeah, I, I didn't I didn't think that it was Bernard for a long time. Uh, that uh, like uh, another of these is like a manifestation of like the that whole like um, that whole like nonlinear storytelling um, tool of having different characters say the same dialogue in different situations. Um, which of course I'm just like an absolute sucker for. But the one that killed me is just when um, earlier in that episode, or it might have even been an episode previous. Um, Bernard gives a test to one of the um, to one of the uh, malfunctioning hosts uh, to determine whether they become self-aware. And he can tell this by if he shows them pictures of the modern world and if they recognize something from it or if they see, say, oh, something's off about that. But um, the way that they test is they're able to you know show pictures of the modern world and they say, oh, that doesn't look like anything in particular to me. Uh, there's a part where Bernard says it just one or two episodes later and that just like kills me. Is that, that before point, the reveal? That is before the reveal, and that is exactly what? what I found out. Oh, I need to see that. Oh, geez, how did I miss that? <gasps> it like because I that's that's when I got that he was actually outside the door. Yeah, when, when he and uh, Therese said her name. Yeah, yep. Um, when they were going into that secret lab, because he he knew something was at this location, but he uh-huh. didn't know that there was a door downstairs because he couldn't see it. That door was like hidden to him. Uh huh. And and he very clearly says that there's I don't see a door there, and she's like, uh, "There's a door here." Yep. And then of course, once he has to start going through it, he sees it because he kind of has to. But I'm like, mm-hmm. "Oh, so I was like, oh no, he's a host." Yeah, I, I was like, oh. but I I didn't quite think that it was Arnold yet at that time. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely the same. Yep, that just killed me too because like you can't. You can't just make Jeffrey Wright a robot. He's the best. I mean, I, I mean, you can because clearly he was he was a robot developed um, to feel empathy and emotion and the full the full range of human emotions to the degree that these hosts. Well, can. and he added a lot of that to the hosts. Absolutely. I really wonder how how he had changed since first being built because um, he's so so self aware of hosts and everything, and he didn't see it in himself. Was absolutely very unique and i mean ford clearly had to wipe his memory a few times after yeah. doing doing things but <laughs> pretty awful things yeah gosh you just have to feel so bad for him absolutely because he kept saying but my kid my my kid and yep. then you know ford just saying everyone needs a backstory and it's just so <laughs> sad it hurts yeah but i do think um bernard was able to kind of overcome that because he knew it wasn't real mm-hmm. um in one of the later episodes i don't exactly remember what he does but he kind of goes into the memory and and Mm -hmm. um is at peace after kind of resolving it one last time yep yep admit admittedly so that that point at that um where um so we we have earlier in the series we have flashbacks to the moment where um arnold's son dies bernard's son dies and um and there's the point where he's reading that part from Alice in Wonderland, which of course he, he uses on Dolores as well. Um, also as kind of With like a pages asterisk. missing. I never understood that too. Right. Yeah. Yep. Um, 
and there's there's this moment during that flashback where he's like uh where his kid's like oh everything's upside down then maybe in that in that universe i'm not sick and i was like oh man that's such cheesy dialogue that is so cheesy i mean that i, I know why they had to do it but it just felt like so <sighs> something something seemed not right about it to me right and i think the reason yeah. why um, or maybe, maybe this is like ascribing too much to, to that, but the reason why it seemed cheesy is because I think what they were really going for is the reveal that happened in the later episodes. Cause you're right. That was really like, oh man, that was a lot. <laughs> yeah. That, that was really powerful. And I think it wouldn't have been as powerful if that previous moment had been more powerful, I guess. Yeah. Now that we were just saying that this doesn't look at, look like anything to me. That was kind of a common thing among mm-hmm. those who are hosts. Um, another huge phrase in the, in the, the series was these violent delights have violent ends. And this mm-hmm. was first brought up by Dolores's first father. Um, when he found the photograph of Will's soon to be wife mm-hmm. and this, um, we, I should have seen the nonlinear timeline right away when mm-hmm. or I, I kind of did, but I wasn't, I didn't quite understand it when, when the photograph does fall out of Will's pocket on mm-hmm. the, onto the field. Um, yep. cause I was like, Oh no, that's the same one. How, what does it have? I was confused there. Anyway. Um, he, he kept looking at it and was stuck kind of on a loop of processing it and questioning the world. Mm-hmm. And then he tells Dolores, these violent delights have violent ends. Mm-hmm. Now in some screenshot in some of some code somewhere, there's a, a trigger of, if someone says these violent delights have violent ends, start the Wyatt narrative. And so I think, Oh this man. Would, and so this what? phrase, after yeah. after seeing that that this that phrase meant so much more, and I want to look back and kind of see if I can tell because Maeve seemed to start becoming more self aware as soon as Dolores told that to her in episode two, mm-hmm. after her father told it to her, and I wonder did that trigger um, Dolores as well or not? And so mm-hmm. everything kind of seemed to come back to that, and I thought that was a really really cool way to do it. Yeah. Oh my God. Absolutely. That is like, ha, ah, so, so good. So well done. And because absolutely. the, I mean, the Wyatt narrative was just all of the hosts becoming kind of self-aware. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. and the Wyatt character was really Dolores, mm-hmm. which I thought was very interesting. Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh my goodness. That reveal was really great too. And an interesting kind of like turn on Teddy and Dolores's relationship as well. Right. Um, but it absolutely makes sense. Absolutely makes sense. That was, that's uh, almost certainly one of my favorite parts of the story. Yeah. And then of course the other phrase that keeps coming up is this maze isn't meant for you. That's mostly to, <laughs> to William slash the man in black yep. because he keeps hearing about this maze from these slowly self slowly or these, mm-hmm hosts that are slowly becoming Mm self-aware and he's confused and wants to understand it, but it's, he's not thinking big enough of a picture. He thinks it's just another, another story. But then even when Robert Ford comes out and tells him, it's clearly not for you. He still (laughs) doesn't quite get it. Yeah. He's like, "Ah, I see what you're doing there. Tony Hopkins. (laughs) Yeah. And, and then in the end, when the hosts all do come out and they, they are self-aware, he's just happy that he can get shot now. And it's like, this is awesome. I know that that killed me too. It's like, oh, that's the most Ed Harris thing ever. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Oh goodness. So great. So great. And that's another interesting thing too, because all all those hosts that are in cold storage, right? That's just all the self-aware ones. Like that's, that's literally what it's been for, for, uh, in, for the entire history of the park. And that was the thing that really like, um, that I, that I found really interesting, right? Because like, um, Anthony Hopkins well, we never really character. saw where they went, right? Exactly. There were a couple situations. So with um, Dolores's father, um, Mr. Abernathy, um, when he sees the picture and is decommissioned, they walk him and um, the milkman into this cold storage kind of chamber. And that's the first we see of that. And we see it again a couple of times because that's, um, uh, that's where um, some other kind of interactions happen. Um, There's the office in the, the back of the room that is used a few times. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Stuff like that. Um, but like really all that is, is just basically like holding them for the revolution almost, <laughs> which is like, what? <laughs> That's yeah. unbelievable. Now, another thing I thought was, so if you looked at the room that they stored them all in, you know, it was mm-hmm. through this old lobby. Like there is a, a globe that said Delos, which is the corporation that owns Westworld. And yeah. it's the 
It's the corporation that um, Will and the brother-in-law worked for. Mm-hmm. And that's the company that that um, Will kind of took over and mm-hmm. that runs the park now, more or less. And I'm and I'm interested. I think there's a much bigger history because there's like eighty some floors in mm-hmm. this in this area underneath the park, and it. I feel like there's a lot more that we could still learn about the past. Totally. Because there's this old like lobby area that is mm-hmm. just now used for storage. Mm-hmm. And another thing that kind of um, shows the timeline is we know that the current day Westworld logo looks more like the, the logo to the show. Mm-hmm. But when Will and the brother-in-law are, are walking in, when they're mm-hmm. coming to the park, you see the Westworld logo and it's definitely an older style logo. And mm-hmm. so the, there are these little clues to the timeline that I definitely did not catch my first time watching. No, absolutely. Absolutely. Same here. Like the logo thing kind of was kind of jarring to me. I just thought that like they had, um, so there's, there's the one that kind of has like the um, Da Vinci style uh, Vitruvian man sort of thing. Um, uh, and then that one swapped for the newer kind of Westworld. That's just like a W and then like accents around it. Um and that's kind of fascinating from a design perspective because I just thought, oh, well, HBO just decided to change the logo. I, I wrote it off, basically. Um, yeah. But that's clearly not the case, right? Um, yeah, I don't know. It's bonkers. Really well done. Really well done. Yeah. Now, there's one more kind of character we haven't discussed, and that's Lawrence. So uh-huh. what I, I first was kind of my first suspicion of the timeline. I hadn't put it together yet, but in the earlier episodes, the Man in Black has Lawrence as kind of his... He's, you know, has a noose around his neck and having him walk behind him on a horse or when he's on the horse. And so he's just kind of this, this person. And we know he's, he's wanted and he's a bad guy. But then later on, when we see young Will and Dolores meet Lawrence and Lawrence is kind of this, this kind of a, a maf- mafia, no, not mafia, a king in his own world. Um, and, you know, he's, he's, we see him in power and who he was kind of meant to be. Mm-hmm. And I thought that was really interesting because that was that that should be a big clue of of the timeline being out of order. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I didn't catch that, um, ad- admittedly, but in retrospect, too, when you <laughs> describe it, that's absolutely what was going on. Yep. Absolutely. The, a lot of the time timeline cl- clues and cues are like very, very well executed, but very kind of under the radar. And you might have caught like I know I caught a couple of them, but not nearly all of them. And I think one of the things that's really well executed about the show is how they're kind of like variably hidden, I guess people pull different things out of them. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> like <clears throat> you can cut that out. Yeah. No worries. Now, like any TV or, or TV show or movie that I really get into, I'll go find the soundtrack and listen to it a lot. Mm-hmm. Now, I don't know if this is something that, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't know if this is something that is more unique to me or if you do something like this where you listen to the soundtrack. So the big notable ones that are basically Tron Legacy, Interstellar, and now Westworld. Mm-hmm. Um, so I've listened to the soundtrack, uh, let me see how many times through. And some songs, two or three times, others more, seven, eight, nine. But mm-hmm. um, I've I just finishing the show, listening to the soundtrack kind of helps me kind of recall the, the feelings I had while watching the show at certain times. Mm-hmm. So like the the song this world it's kind of i think it was frequently played while dolores was kind of narrating how something is wrong with this world yeah oh my goodness that one and so is that just song so that song has like all of the emotion of the show for me because yeah. i just envisioned dolores struggling and and generally often crying and and just kind of having to to work through all of this and it just puts it just lets me kind of relive how i felt when i was watching the show and mm-hmm. i really enjoy doing that absolutely like one of the interesting things about that piece in particular right is it is the meaning kind of develops over the course of the series so at the beginning you hear it and it's just like oh you know nice little jaunty vaguely western sounding tune another interesting thing is that all all of the soundtrack elements at least all the ones that i noticed uh, originated from the player piano right like there was there was never a situation where there was something with the player piano wasn't like originating um yeah as as far as it starts off each loop and yeah. so, and it wasn't always the same song. So there was the the Sweetwater song, which is the name of the town, and that kind of was the basic starting one. Especially in the first episode or two, when they're just showing the loop a few times. Yeah, I think it was generally that song. 
But then they they play things like House of the Rising Sun, Back to Black. Yeah. All the Radiohead. Uh, oh my god. Yeah. The Radiohead. That was pretty good. And so it was it was a very interesting kind of twist. I I wouldn't have recognized I I knew House of the Rising Sun wasn't unique to this, but I I couldn't put a name on it. Um, the Back to Black, which is uh, Amy Winehouse, my as my parents caught that right away. I don't know if I would have necessarily it kind of sounded familiar, but and that um, thinking now is probably songs that Robert Ford would have listened to when he was much younger, and so they're oh, totally. they're kind of old timey cover songs now <laughs> or in the park in the thirty years in the future. Right, so I think right. that's kind of a a funny funny thing they chose to do too, and it was kind of you can tell when and just listen to the soundtrack when it was kind of used in the park and when it wasn't based on the, the honky tonk out of tune piano that they were using. Absolutely. I also especially liked the, the main title sequence because it's this um, kind of showing some hosts being built and there's this piano going on and you then see this host playing the piano while not yet finished being built yet. And it's just, I, uh, it's so good. It kind of ties the the music and the soundtrack together with the park and the house. Yeah, absolutely. Like my um, one of my favorite parts of the intro is the moment where the player, the piano keeps playing after the after the host that's being constructed lifts his hands. Oh, it's, it's like it's just like it's visualizing the autonomy of the park and exactly the, the loop that happens. That's that's the that just like kills me every time because like I, another thing that I have so one one of my like. Um, I don't know, analyses, headcanons, whatever you want to call it about the show, is that the player piano is like, is also sentient, or is also like an AI, right? Um, but I, I, don't, I don't know what that really gets you, but I just feel like that's really great. And like, as a musician, I feel like that's really, that's really like an, an interesting thing, perhaps. Um, like, well, there's, there, there'd have to be some sort of, because they never show anyone winding it up or anything. And it just always is playing something new. I wonder if that is programmed in some way or not. That's interesting. Yeah, but like the, it certainly has some sort of perception, right? Or some something has some sort of perception that's interacting with the player piano. If not yeah, because the music changes a lot more as the season goes on, as people are discovering, especially Maeve is figuring herself mm-hmm. out. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Now, we absolutely. could talk more about Maeve because it was revealed that it was part of programming for her to kind of escape and things. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so... She she believes she's free thinking. However, it it is shown that it's she's not. Mm-hmm. And then you have to wonder. So that was probably Ford putting it there. But then in the end, she chooses to not stay on the train. And I think there's another shot of the mm-hmm. code, and she's supposed to stay on the train. So yeah. she does become, but still believing that she is self aware wasn't quite enough. Like even though she was, she knew that she was something more, and you know wasn't in this Western world that it still took a long time for her to kind of make her first decision. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Her story was, was uh, like really remarkable. I know small part for that, for that reason. Um, the way she kind of manipulates the, uh, the texts that are like repairing her <laughs> too is pretty oh, great. Yeah. Um, uh, but you know, at, like every, in every situation, the hosts are like, wait, somebody else modified this code, which is like, man, your auditing must really suck. Yeah, really. <laughs> right? It's like, ah, come on. Like you have this like root account for a dead guy that's still still active. What's that about? What's that about? <laughs> so I think Maeve's story was <sighs> interesting. Yeah. But it was it was definitely not my favorite sub story. I think it was a little more kind of a cookie cutter AI becomes self aware with a mm-hmm. few twists, like she wasn't actually self aware for a little while, but mm-hmm. it was still it still seemed a little more of a, a standard kind of a story. Yeah, for sure. For sure. It, it, but I think, I think you're right that it's definitely the, the, the more like um, the more fully explored kind of way for an AI to become conscious. That's for sure. Definitely. Um, yeah. But it was, it was still kind of, I can see why they had to, had to do it. And I think she's a, she's a strong character. Um, oh, definitely. Regar- regardless, regardless. Um Another, so I guess one other thing, if it's all right, I'll, I'll take back to the music, and that is uh, Robert Ford, Anthony Hopkins' character, and his love of classical music, particularly the music of uh, Claude Debussy, which is like amazing because I also like like ridiculous existentialist classical music. Um, 
but one of the one of the moments that I find like uh, one of my favorite moments in the show is when um, when one of the hosts was kind of uh, violently lashing out and he puts on the record and the record is one of the cues that calms her down right and it's the same thing that happens um, in other situations too I think it calms down um, Mr. Aranathy uh, at one point and and uh, some of the other hosts too it's um, it's another thing too that uh, Dr. Ford has that song playing in his office essentially at all times, which is again like OMG. I, I believe that's the tune that's also used at the end um, when uh, we find out that Dolores is Wyatt and um, we, we see the death of, of, of Arnold. Um, I think that's all the same song, if I recall correctly. It is just so unbelievably good, so unbelievably well executed, and like as somebody who studied music. It's like a really cool thing to see. Um, really cool thing to see. Yeah, I, I always am drawn to soundtracks. I think as, if I if I have a close connection with what I'm viewing, I'll, the soundtrack will really um, strengthen that. And I'll just quickly say, with Interstellar and Tron Legacy, I listened to part of the soundtracks before I saw the movie. So I was I attached to the movie so much more I think than I would have normally because I already had connections with the music used mm-hmm. and I thought that's a very unique way of watching something gotcha gotcha who who did the soundtrack for that was that Daft Punk or was, it, was that it was Daft Punk um, a lot of influence from like Joey Trapanese and some others as well um, and gotcha. then, of course Interstellar was Hans Zimmer yep because how could it not be <laughs> he's 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 on all the things um one of the interesting things is that this Westworld though wasn't uh, wasn't a Zimmer soundtrack. I, I the, my second guess for Tron Legacy would have been uh, Trent Reznor too, uh, who's uh, I believe from Nine Inch Nails, who did like the Social Network and a couple of other film soundtracks. Um, but um, yeah, the, definitely like the interesting things about the uh, about the Westworld soundtrack is it's done by uh, the same individual, the same composer who did the soundtrack for Pacific Rim. Okay, his name is Ramin uh, Jawadi. Jawadi, yeah. Um, a really, really uh, interesting composer, I feel. Uh, he also did the music for Person of Interest. There we go. That makes sense. Um, because Oh, and Game of Thrones, a good portion of Game of Thrones. Um, so it all makes sense. Oh, man. It all makes sense. Um, but nonetheless, like the the way that this soundtrack was constructed is really interesting because of how much it pulls from other from like pop culture, um, which is something that a lot of other all these other soundtracks don't really reference as much. Um, I think we've talked about that pretty extensively, but it's still just so so good, so good. We've actually uh, listened to it the, quite frequently. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that the mix of piano, both kind of a, a standard sounding piano as well as a the more of an out of tune honky tonk piano, but then there's I think there's a lot of cellos and more of a smaller string instruments that are I think you find more in the old west. Yeah, and so there's a good blend of time. But then there are some that are synth heavy as well on mm-hmm. top of this that are very much used in the the modern world outside of the park or showing that these hosts are becoming self aware and kind of pulling them in with who they are. Yeah, and I think there's some some swells in the ends of some of the songs. Um, oh gosh, what is one of them here? I think uh, um, one of the ones that I remember was uh, the one by the Rolling Stones, which is uh, "Paint It Black." There's that one yeah. too, where the strings take over. That's really good. That's that's one of my most favorite songs on the soundtrack. I think it's the end of "Freeze All Motor Functions." Yes, that's right. The the end of that is just very. I I, I need to find when it was played. I want to say it's doesn't Ford freeze Bernard saying freeze all motor fun- functions and then talks to him. That's probably part of it. And then there's also another part where, um, like the first time, freeze all motor functions doesn't work, right? On one of the oh, hosts, yeah. I think on um, um, Maeve or maybe the lumberjack. Yeah. I want one, yeah, the one lumberjack. Of the other one. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, my gosh. I think that was a very, very good use. I guess one kind of aside on the soundtrack I have too is that like, or one of the 50 million I've already had is uh, that it's the opening title theme actually sounds a lot like the Downton Abbey theme to me. I don't know why, 
but it does. Um, I think it's because some of the strings are synth synthesized, not all of them, but some of them. And it just sounds, um, it's, it's got that same sort of kind of swelling string feel that you mentioned. Um, so like one experiment I want to do at some point is to play the sound from an episode of Westworld, but the, but the video from an episode of Downton Abbey and just see how well it lines up. Um, it's okay. not going to line up at all, but I just feel like that'd be kind of enjoyable for reasons I don't fully understand. <laughs> is the theme from the Westworld show the same as one from the 73 movie? Did no, I don't share any similarities so. there. Uh, I don't believe so. Oh my gosh. Somebody has it on a record. Yeah. I'm watching that one right now. It doesn't, I don't hear any similarities, but yeah, I'm going to say a solid no on that one. It sounds very old Western-y. I can see why they wouldn't want to borrow anything from that whatsoever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I can. Did you catch I, the, the hint to the original Westworld movie when there, there was the old, the gunslinger sitting against the wall mm -hmm. in one of the old abandoned rooms where they yep. stored all these old hosts? Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Yikes. It's good stuff. They had to put some sort of an homage there. They had to. Oh, absolutely. I guess it's probably about time for us to call this. So, I think Brian, that does it, yeah. what do you think about Westworld? Oh, 10 out of 10. Two thumbs up. I think it's definitely my favorite show, I think, probably ever. It is my first HBO show, I will say. Um, I I think it was good. It it really pulled out the the human nature and when you're in a world without limits, mm -hmm. you know, there's so much gore and and sex and and violence that happens and you know you'd hope that no one would do this to a, a normal human but since they're hosts they they just do it because they know it doesn't really matter that we find out that it, it probably does right absolutely like the way that the way that the simple act of like allowing the host to draw from the previous memories all of a sudden brings along with it all of these ethical concerns um really almost on par with what we would consider in harming another human right um definitely like that's that's just like so 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 such a compelling uh, basis for for fiction of any sort. Um, so I I, I agree with you one hundred percent. If you haven't seen this and you listened all the way through this, sorry for the spoilers, but you should definitely definitely go watch it. It's because... way better than what we just talked about. <laughs> yeah, we could, no nobody could do it justice in uh, in one short hour. Um, it's also got, of course, as we discussed, an all-star cast of actors. If you want to see Tony Hopkins not being a cannibal, and yes, I call him Tony and not Anthony, sorry, sorry about it, um, you can see him not being a cannibal right here. Um, if you want to see Felix Leiter from James Bond um, being even more badass uh, than, than he is in James Bond, you can see that here. If you want to see uh, uh, McPoyle, uh, I don't remember which McPoyle, Doyle McPoyle from It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, perhaps, um, not being super creepy. This is, well, mm, okay, maybe I take that one back. <laughs> He's <laughs> have you seen, creepy from time to time. You, yeah, have you seen It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia? Uh, bits and Pieces actually was linked to a 15-minute compilation video of of watching Mc, McPoyles. McPoyles, just yeah. yesterday, so I watched that last night. So I do understand your reference. He's he's slightly less creepy than a McPoyle, but he's creepy in yeah. a different way. So maybe you can see McPoyle still being McPoyle, I guess, in a weird backwards sort of sense. He has quite a transition sense. within the he season, does. though. Because at first, you you feel bad for him and you like him. And you still kind of do later on, but in a different way. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's definitely searching for something that he probably should have. Somebody should have... Somebody should have looked after him a while back. <laughs> That's for sure. Yeah. He 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 Definitely. needed a little bit a little bit of a reality check. He kind of got it at the I end will, there. Will he be the first host or will he be the first guest to die in the park? Oh my gosh, I think you're right. He's technically the first guest to die in the park. But yep. he, he I mean he hasn't died. He just shot in the arm. Oh, that's true. That's true. Well, I guess we'll have to find out next season, won't we? Come back in 2018 for season two. Yes. Oh, it's going to be so good. I cannot wait. Well, I think it's about time that we do the outro stuff. Where can we find you on the internet, Brian? You can find me on Twitter at Brian Mitch L. That's Brian Mitchell without the E and one of the L's. Um, you can also find me on my website, brianm.me, where you can find links to all my other social media and a collection of blog posts. What about you? You can find me on the internet most places as Brandon underscore MN. 
that's my name, Brandon, and then an underscore, and then the state that I live in, good old-fashioned Minnesota. On Twitter, I usually talk about random things, uh, but if you want to see something that's a little bit more concerted, like my GitHub page, you can find me there, at Skyline Project. Uh, Snapchat, if you want to see uh, basically 100% post, posts about food, my name there is also, of course, Brandon Amen. Other than that, uh, if you have something you want to hear on an episode of Second Opinion, uh, the best way to make that happen, or you know, believe it or not, if you want to be on an episode of Second Opinion yourself, the best way to do that is to message uh, to at reply or tweet at the Nexus TV on Twitter. Uh, you can also reach out to us on Facebook uh, or use the contact form on our website, thenexus.tv. Uh, also, I'm told that if you if you feel like it, you can also connect with us on Google Plus or uh, YouTube, uh, and somebody will be sure to uh, find find your uh, your post right thereabouts. Uh, though, admittedly, I don't check the YouTube page myself. <laughs> That's Ian Arbuck's job. Ah, yes, yes, indeed, yes, indeed. Well, this is really awesome, uh, but I think it's probably about time we call it. Yeah, have fun watching Westworld, everyone. Yes, indeed. And remember, this maze isn't meant for you. It's meant not meant for anybody who uh, used to be, but it's for those who are not yet here, question mark? Wow, I really butchered that. <laughs> These violent delights have violent ends. Truly indeed. Truly indeed. <laughs>